journals, and we'll turn to number 330 to get started. 330, I would be like Jesus. 330. Stand with me if you're able. Earthly pleasures vainly call me. I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me. I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song. In the home and in the throne. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. He has broken every fetter. I would be like Jesus. That my soul would love him better. I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus this in the home and in the throne. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. All the way from earth to glory. Jesus, telling o'er and o'er the story, I would be like Jesus, be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng, be like Jesus all day. That his words well done may greet. I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song. In the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. Amen. Doc, will you open the service in prayer? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your love to us. We thank you in the middle of the week when some of sing the songs of Zion to hear your word preached and pray together. We thank you, dear Lord, that we could still do that in America. We thank you that we could do that here in the grave. Bless our church this week, pray. Bless our preachers who preach it to us tonight. Bless it as we read this in the Bible study. Help us, dear Lord, to read it new truth in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I was talking to my brother in Canada, and uh, they're pretty restricted on where they can meet and how they can meet. And he was just telling me, we uh, see, this was Tuesday. Tuesday night, they get together for a meeting, and they met in one of the men's garage in, uh, in the church. They met in the garage because they're not allowed to meet in the church. So that's, uh, isn't that amazing? But uh, as far as announcements goes, um, Florence's husband passed away. So um, there will be visitation and the funeral at the um, uh, Fruit May funeral home in, on Monday. That's basically all I have for details. I, I, I believe it's going to be afternoon visitation and then a five o'clock uh, service so um, that uh, more details on that I'm sure but then next week uh, there will be a youth rally here at seven o'clock on Friday the 14th and um, that'll start out with some some eating and then move into some games and then into um, a message so probably have about 45 or 50 kids uh, here that night and uh, so are you going to be available that night Merlin or pro okay no problem um, and then on the next day January 15th there'll be quizzing chapter 8 Acts um, pardon me chapter 7 of Acts um, and we'll be going over to South Haven I believe that's what's coming up did I miss anything? Is there anything sooner than that? 
No. Okay, good. Take your hymnals again, 336, 336, constantly abiding, 336. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. The trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so And 340, <coughs> 340, <clears throat> blessed quietness. 340. Joys are flowing like a river since the comforter has come. He abides with us forever, makes the trusting heart his home. Quietness, what assurance in my soul. On the stormy sea, he speaks peace to me. How the billows cease to roll. Bringing life and health and gladness all around that heavenly guest. Banished unbelief and sadness, changed our weariness to rest. Blessed quietness, holy quietness, what assurance in my soul. <coughs> How the pillows cease to roll. Let's do verse 4. See a fruitful field is growing, blessed fruit of righteousness, and the streams of life are flowing. In the lonely wilderness, blessed quietness, holy quietness, how to show it's in my soul. Peace speaks, peace speaks peace to me, how the billows cease to roll. What a wonderful salvation, where we all see his face. What a perfect habitation, what a quiet resting place. Blessed quietness, holy quietness, what a show it's in my 
my soul on the stormy seas it pleased to me how the billows cease to Good singing tonight. Now Doc came back wanting us to install a praise band. Wasn't it, Doc? You wanted us? <laughs> oh, no, I guess not. Well, it's good to have you back safely. Genesis chapter 50 tonight, if you will. Genesis chapter 50. This passage, uh, Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21, is the first time that the word forgive is mentioned. Um, and any of its derivatives, forgave, forgiveness, uh, forgiven. And so if you adhere to the law of first mention, this passage would lay the foundation for the understanding of forgiveness. In Bible studies, the concept of the law of first mention is that uh, to understand a particular word or a doctrine, find the first place it is revealed and study that passage, and you will find it in its simplicity, in its simplest form, and in its clearest form. And so if that is true, there's other passages, many other passages that are more common that we think of, and that would be like Matthew 18... Uh, with Jesus, the parable about forgiveness, and then in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. But uh, this is the first time it's mentioned, and so I just want to bring forth some, some thoughts concerning forgiveness tonight. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us. And will certainly requite us of all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God, the God of thy father, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought it evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you be glorified now as we uh, look into your word. This is a big subject, certainly not something that can be covered in any one uh, service. But I pray that you would help us to maybe ponder a little bit more upon it and and what it means to us. It is the foundation. Forgiveness is the foundation of salvation. It would not be possible for us to be saved if we were not offered forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you would help us in, in turn to forgive others the trespasses against us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand. Help it to be clear, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So forgiveness is taught all through the scripture, probably more familiar with Jesus' teachings in the Lord's Prayer. And, and then in Matthew 18, when Peter asked, how oft um, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? It's very important for us to get a hold of this concept concerning forgiveness, not for our brother's sake, but rather for our sake. For our physical well-being, for our mental well-being, and of course, for our spiritual well-being. But um, sure, it's for the other person too. But more importantly, forgiving heals the forgiver. Think of the burden of bitterness that, that Joseph could have carried. It, it could have ruined his life. We could have never heard of him after he was sold into Egypt. 
And yet, because he was not willing to carry that bitterness and because he forgave, you know, we're not told how long it took him to come to the place where he forgave his brothers. We're not told that. We're just told that he did forgive them. <clears throat> and uh, probably decades before, before this passage even um, was, was recorded. If we were to go back to uh, chapters 43 and 44, 45, we would see the first time <clears throat> that Joseph's brothers came down into Egypt uh, to get corn. And that process of, of yes, he, he tested their metal a little bit. And um, I, I, I don't know whether that was right or wrong. He obviously thought it was necessary to know where they stood. But this is 22 years after they sold him into slavery. He's 39 years old. And, 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 and he's tested them a little bit. And now this, they, they've lived in the land of Egypt for 17 more years, and Joseph is 56 years old. And now they're, they're still bothered. The consciences are still bothered. They are um, they're afraid. And it comes to Joseph's attention by way of messenger, and he, he's surprised at the realization, and it makes him sad that his brothers don't realize that long, long ago he forgave them. He forgave them a long time ago. And so I just want to look at a few truths about forgiveness. That we could probably add another dozen to what I'm going to talk about tonight or more. But um, this is a huge subject. And I just want to bring out a few truths. Number one, we need to realize that every one of us needs to be forgiven. Every one of us needs to be forgiven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. Uh, we have turned everyone to his own way. Every person has done wrong to somebody, to somebody else. And uh, as I have hurt others, others have hurt me. And every one of us needs to learn both to forgive and to be forgiven. Forgiveness is an act, not so much an attitude, but the heart uh, will catch up eventually. And that's kind of a, something that you need to stop and think about for a minute. Because it, it's not easily grasped. But initially, God calls us, you and me, to forgive whether we feel like it or not. Whether we feel angry, whether we feel hateful, whether we feel upset, whether we feel bitter, whether we feel full of self-pity still. God still calls upon us to um, forgive and you know, Corey Ten Boom, probably one of the greatest teachers on forgiveness. Um, if you want to learn about forgiveness, get some of Corey Ten Boom's books. Uh, she wrote, forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Wow. Amen. That's good. Just a little bit about her. During World War II, Corrie ten Boom was uh, a Dutch watchmaker. Her family was watchmakers in the Netherlands. And at that time, um, in World War II, uh, it was occupied by Germany. And they saved hundreds, literally hundreds, of Jews that were going through their area by hiding them in their house until finally she and her family were caught and sent to a concentration camp and then eventually to a death camp. Of course, the Lord um, overruled and, and Corey herself was, was uh, spared. Her life was spared. But she struggled really hard with forgiveness. You can imagine the struggle that she would have would probably parallel with Joseph's. Um, being sold into slavery, and, and, and who knows what happened to him during that time, and then being put in prison, um, probably much like what she went through. Until one day after the war, she is speaking, um, as she did many times in a church, telling her story and telling and teaching on forgiveness, and she's teaching in Germany, and after the service, one of her old camp guards came up to her and 
she recognized him immediately, and, she, and he didn't remember her at all. And he came up to her and he said, I became a Christian after the war. Your message about forgiveness touched me very much. You told about the camp Ravensbrook. I was a camp guard there, and I've always wanted to ask forgiveness of someone personally. And so I ask you, will you forgive me? She's just taught about forgiveness. She said, it felt like my blood was freezing. There suddenly stands before me a man who is co-responsible for the slow and horrible deaths of my loved ones. And he dares to ask me forgiveness. All of the beautiful stories and sermons come flooding back over me. And forgiveness is my turn to forgive and I can't. His hand is being held out to her and she won't take it. She says, I prayed softly to Jesus. I don't want this. You have to help me. And then she realized forgiveness is not an emotion. It is an act of the wheel, will. The feeling is not there, but I still can move my hand. And so she put out her hand almost mechanically. And she says, something extraordinary happens. I suddenly feel a warm wave through my body, from the shoulder through my arm to, my, to our hands, and I cry, I forgive you, my brother, with all my heart. And there we stood, the camp guard and the prisoner. For a long time we held hands. Never before have I experienced the love of God so deeply. It's amazing. If you wait... To feel ready to forgive, you'll never forgive. You'll never forgive. You must make the decision to forgive, and your, car, your heart will catch up later on. The Lord will take care of your heart. She later wrote, Forgiveness is setting the prisoner free, only to find that prisoner was me. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. God commands us to forgive, and therefore if we don't forgive, it's sin. It's iniquity in our hearts. If we refuse to forgive, not only does it show that we really don't truly understand what we have been forgiven, but also it develops a bitterness that slowly erodes my relationship with God. When I kneel down to pray, that bitterness is there. And so it's not that God is any further away, it's I'm further away from God. And so we can't... Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 31, Let bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, what? Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. If we can keep that in mind, what God has for, what God has forgiven us for Christ's sake, there shouldn't be anything that we won't forgive. Secondly, we need to realize that God is always sovereign and he is always in control. He is sovereign and he is always in control. Everything, every tiny detail that happens in my life, God's not surprised. And he's in, and he, and he's in control. And it is directed, my life is directed by God for good if I love him. That's what Romans 8.28 says. All things work together for good to them that love God. Yes, your enemies still have a free will. Yes, your enemies can uh, use that free will to hurt you. But God's sovereignty says he is in control and he will not allow anything to happen that won't be for your good. Yes, Daniel and his, four, and his three friends were were taken away in chains to Babylon. God allowed that. But he didn't allow them to burn in the fiery furnace. Even though the enemy wanted them to. And so God's sovereignty. He's fully in control. 
Everything he allows is going to further my good and his kingdom if I love him. If I love him. Do we believe that? Then if that's so, then we need to forgive the offender because God is in control. And really, my unforgiveness is directed at him. It is directed primarily at him first. Joseph looked back and he saw the hurt. <clears throat> Joseph looked back and he saw the betrayal and the pain and the loneliness. And as he stood there as president or second in command of all the land of Egypt, the world power at that time, he realized that God had used everything that he went through to prepare him for that very time. And he forgave. He told the brothers, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring it to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. What an attitude to have toward God and his brothers. What a model to follow. Job 23, <clears throat> verse number 10 says, But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, we're going to have to go through trials. We're going to have to go through hard times. It's unreasonable to think that God will select somebody for a great work and not put him through. All around us, we see exactly the opposite. Somebody who is, is going to be elevated through biz in business is going to go to school, learn, study hard. He's going to be put to the test before he's given a position. Somebody who who's comes up and is prominent in sports, what's he going to be? He's going to be in the gym at 4 o'clock every morning, working out. He's going to be tested to the uh, nth degree. And yet, for some reason, we think God should allow us to be on a bed of roses and not go through any trials. Job says, when he had tried me, I shook him forth as gold. If you truly believe, believe in the absolute sovereignty of God, then you will immediately forgive your offender from your heart because, uh, number one, God works all things for good. He won't allow anything in my life that is not for my good. And then, because of the debt that he had forgiven, that I could never repay. And if I harbor an unforgiving spirit, an unforgiving attitude, that is sin against God, first of all. Forgiveness starts with the appreciation for what I've been forgiven. Interestingly enough, in this case, though it's clear that Joseph did forgive his brothers, nowhere does it say that Joseph said, you are forgiven. No, it says, he just says, Fear not. He says, fear not. And then he points them to the sovereignty of Almighty God. God's in control. He, you, I mean, you don't need to fear. What you did wasn't you. That was God. God allowed what happened for my good. He just points them to the sovereignty of God. You know all those injustices that I re received from you? You know what uh, Potiphar did and what Potiphar's wife did to me. You know what happened in prison? You know what Th that butler after I did good to him and uh, and he forgot me for two two more years in prison. You know all of that. God meant it for good and I'm safe in his hands and I don't worry about it. Amen. Thirdly, uh, forgiveness isn't earned; it's given. Forgiveness is, is, is in a way it's like a gift. But it's not earned, it's, it is given. Forgiveness should be given with no expectations, um, no, no, no strings attached, so to speak. You've probably heard of somebody, maybe you've apologized to somebody and they'll say, okay, but don't do it again. That's not real forgiveness. That, that, that's holding a brick over your head. Uh, if you could do it again, you're not forgiven this time either. That wasn't the attitude that Jesus told Peter, was it? 
Proper understanding of forgiveness is to make right the relationship with God first, primarily, and then with your fellow man. Forgiveness, you know, forgiveness indeed comes from God. It is given uh, primarily from God himself. In fact, when Jesus hung on the cross, he didn't say, I forgive all you, even though you don't know what you do. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is from God. Forgiveness is from the Father. And if we don't have a right attitude with, uh, towards our brother, we're not going to have a right attitude towards the Father. And in order to have a right attitude towards your brother, you're going to have to have the right attitude or uh, the attitude of forgiveness um, toward God as well because he allowed it in, in, in your life. When Jesus hung on the cross, his heart was right with God. Even though he bore all of our sins unjustly, his heart was right with God. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There was no bitterness. We see that same attitude in Joseph. Fear not, for am I in the place of God? I'd be sinning against God if I did not forgive and leave it in that hands. We know this was at Joseph's attitude. This was his attitude <clears throat> when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife. He said, I'd be sinning against God if I did that. And so he had a, a proper view of the sovereignty of God. Fourthly, we need to realize that true forgiveness ends in kindness. And it's not a, 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 a stern sense of duty, so to speak. Verse number 21, now... Therefore, fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. So that whole attitude of Ephesians 3, or 4.32, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving. Forgiveness in, ends with, with a kind attitude. He comforted them. He's kind to them. Sometimes people's forgiveness... So-called forgiveness is, they, they, they say, we're burying the hatchet. But they leave the handle out in case they need to grab it. In case they need to, some ammunition down the road or something. If we truly forgive as God forgives, we won't bring it up once it's dealt with. Some people say, well, well you need to forgive and forget. Well, that's a good concept, but we're human. We don't ever forget. Unless it's something we need to remember. Huh? But as far as offenses go, we, we have a hard time forgetting. And so it's much more than that. It's not really possible to forget. But true forgiveness is choosing to forgive over and over again as the Lord brings, as, as it comes up. Laying it on the altar. Lord, that's yours. Lord, this one's yours. I can't handle this. And... Um, Constantly letting go, constantly yielding to God. And Jesus told Peter, Peter said, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? And Jesus said, 490. 70 times seven. That's how many times. Stop keeping score, Peter. <laughs> Stop keeping track. Um, you'll never be able to forgive as much as you've been forgiven. So you, you, can, you can put it up against the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive as many times as he's forgiven you. Wow. Uh, you won't be able to count it. And then last, I just want to uh, bring out, we need to realize that forgiveness doesn't start when the offender apologizes. Forgiveness doesn't start just when the offender apologizes. Forgiveness starts even before someone asks for forgiveness. It, be, it, it, it begins between you and God. In fact, some people will never ask for forgiveness. Probably the people who not need to ask for forgiveness the most never will in your life. But you can still forgive between you and God. Corey Ten Boom said, Forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hatred 
It is a power that breaks the chains of bitterness and the shackles of unselfishness. We're not told exactly when Joseph forgave his brothers, but I'm guessing it was way back in Potiphar's house. Why do I say that? Because he didn't have a bitter attitude. He served uh, in Potiphar's house, and it says that that godless man, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him. He had a testimony. You don't have a testimony if you have a bitter attitude. And I've got an idea that, that, that Joseph forgave his brothers way back then. In Matthew chapter 6, the Lord is teaching his disciples how that they should live and do things contrary to how the Pharisees are doing them. When you give alms, you give them privately. And the Lord and, and the Father in secret will see and, and reward thee openly. When you pray, pray privately to the Father who knows. When you fast, it should be done in secret so that just the Father knows. And, and, and that develops that uh, relationship between uh, you and the Father. And in the middle of this teaching on how we should, or they should conduct themselves in private, directing all worship toward the Lord alone, he, he teaches on prayer. He teaches what we commonly know as the Lord's Prayer. And, and teaches the disciples the things that are important to pray in prayer. This is not a public prayer. This is not what we, I mean, we commonly uh, have it recited publicly, don't we? But this is what the, the, the Lord taught the disciples to pray privately. Forgiveness starts privately. Uh, it, it, it starts personally, one-on-one -on -one with you and the Lord. And in the middle of what we know as the Lord's Prayer, he says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Amen. And so we pray, including in our prayer, who we need to forgive, what we need to forgive. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And it starts out in a private prayer between you and the Father. And after our, our Lord's prayer was complete, just in case the disciples didn't quite fully get it, immediately after, Amen, he says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your, Father, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. He's saying, look, this is a matter that starts between you and your father. This is a matter that starts between you and your heavenly father. If your heart is not right privately with God, then it's not going to be right publicly with men either. These are just some thoughts I wanted to bring out. I know there's many more as I was reading through the, the life of Joseph, this thought of, of forgiveness just is so strong. I know it's a big subject, but I, I hope this gets us thinking. What do I need to do? What am I harboring that is not, that I'm not properly forgiving? What am I not yielding to God? Are my prayers hindered because I fail to forgive we ought to be quick to forgive because of what we have been give forgiven ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 very clear for christ's sake we are forgiven and then we're told in first john chapter 2 verse 12 i write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake all that we're forgiven for because of Jesus Christ, for his name's sake, that God has forgiven us. Oh, we ought to be so quick to forgive, shouldn't we? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your patience with us, for your uh, long-suffering. Lord, I pray that you would help us to desire to be more Christ-like in this matter of forgiving. Be with us, we pray now, as we 
go into our prayer time. Be with Florence and her family tonight, we pray. Lord, I pray that you would give her comfort in the days and weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll go